Okay, welcome, dear colleagues, to this uh, panel discussion. Um, we asked the uh, three of you to uh, think about a short introductory statement. And um, I think I will introduce you first, and then I ask you for your uh, short statement, and um, then we continue to, to the next panelist. I think this could be the mode of operation. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Anne Christensen. Anne has a very long record of um, outstanding um, managing projects in the regard of discovery systems. And today, Anne is uh, managing director, I hope it's the correct term in English, of Effective Web Works. And uh, yeah, welcome and please continue with your statement. <laughs> I understand the concept. Um, I I keep thinking of myself as this angry old white woman these days, <laughs> because um, yeah, actually because I feel that there are a lot of ideas out there, and every idea that comes to me, um, I think, well, how are we going to manage? How are we going to manage technically, financially? Um, um, and and with our resources. And I think that both with regard to our company and uh, to the libraries we, we are serving, um, there are so many issues out there. Um, most of them have been brilliantly addressed in, in, um, uh, by the other uh, uh, from, from the tables. Um, I would like to add that there are, we feel that there are a lot of security issues regarding the tech, uh, te technical challenges. We haven't discussed these most, uh, these much. Um, it's not very sexy to discuss. It's, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not satisfying, not gratifying work, not something where you can excel at, least, least, of, I, uh, least of all me. But this is something that is a big issue. And um, I... I have liked to discuss um, the n not particularly the, the technical, the actual technical challenges, but the challenges in project management. Mm -hmm. This is something that's very dear to my heart, which, like I said earlier, um, which is also why I was so enthusiastic to hear about what Stabi Berlin does, where mm. librarians start to actually work with in 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 yaml files and and stuff like that and i think we need to um take an example from that and we need we need um we still need more involvement from librarians in these projects they are not technical projects they are they 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 touch the heart of of what libraries are about and um so this is important um with regard to discovery systems being the central platform, I'm not so sure about this. I, I, I don't think discovery and central should be in the same sentence because we all know discovery happens at a lot of places. And um, of course, you the innuendo was that we need to think about AI and large language models, which we do and which, which, which is going to, going to be exciting. Um, but um, we also have to think of the discovery system as one piece in a larger universe. And uh, we are working on discovery systems as well. And discovery systems are all about entities and identifiers. And they make the data that is stored in them um, exposable to the wider web. And this is sometimes I think the discovery systems are too much of a silo. And this is something I feel would be a good idea to mm -hmm. change. Okay. Yeah. I'm stopping now. Thank okay? you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, Damien, do you have your? Okay. Do you have one microphone to share? Okay. Um, next one. Uh, he uh, also was already on stage. Damien Katz is director of library technology at the Villanova University. Um, the Villanova is this is the VNDU in Viewfind, right? Okay. He's uh, yeah. Director of Library Technology, Community Manager of WooFind in the context of the OLF representation of WooFind and um, the known maintainer of the WooFind code base. So it's it's sort of a strange thing to be so deeply involved in WooFind because I have a lot of strong feelings about it. It means a lot to me. It has, you know, I have a lot of deep experience with it. 
And when we face times like this with the rise of AI and all these new things, there's certainly a part of me that thinks, oh, this is a threat to my baby and I don't want my baby to die. But the thing is that you have to recognize in software that all software is extremely ephemeral. All of it is going to grow up and leave home and go away. Or maybe it will continue to evolve until it's no longer recognizable as what it started as. But either way, all of the hard work we all put into writing this code gets thrown away pretty quickly in the grand scheme of things. And that's somewhat unsatisfying on some level, which is why I do other things in my career <laughs> in addition to writing software. But the, the lasting value that I think we get out of all of this is the community and the collaboration and the thought that goes in. The lessons we learn, I think, last longer than the software itself. And so, you know, as I say, a certain part of me wants to react to the technological revolutions of the last couple of years with a threat response. And, and there are, I think, legitimate reasons to be concerned about it on multiple levels. But I think it's important to not think about it in just a defensive way. And I think it's great that we are all here and can leverage our strength as a community, as well as I think our ethical commitments as library professionals to uh, find ways to leverage this in beneficial ways that think about consequences as opposed to just leaping into the next fad and hoping for the best, so. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, Felix Ostrowski um, is known uh, to me for his uh, long-standing activities in the regard of linked data and the semantic web in libraries. Today, he is head of innovation management and online services at the uh, Berlin State Library, which uh, quite recently is switched to viewfind. And yeah, please. Yes, I, I think I have to cut myself short. I put on so many ideas, but I would start with the angle of expectations because uh, there was the question, um, do people come for us looking for knowledge instead of documents? And I would say people have always come to us looking for knowledge. Nobody comes to us, oh, this is a great book. I'll put it on my kitchen counter and I'll take it back tomorrow, right? So um, then let's talk about what AI can do there. I, I think we should really just step back a little bit because as you just said 15 years ago i was involved in the whole linked open data thing and it was going to change the world and the semantic web would be there and everything would be different and it's not so let's talk about large language models in 15 years and see where we are so i don't know if they can provide a shortcut because you also have to think about they don't provide knowledge all they do is create another document and that can be a good document or a bad document let's just you know, stick, stick with that. Um, so maybe as Duran Auer introduced yesterday, it can be quite nice to give a first introduction to a certain topic, like an abstract, but for deep scientific work, you're gonna need to read a lot of text if it's generated or not. It's just not gonna be there on a single page. Like there's no shortcut, I believe, to knowledge. Um, so then if we put that aside, what? You know, I, th I think there's more low-hanging fruits, actually. How many people here index full texts into their discovery systems? Uh, well, okay, a couple of them, right? Um, how many do that with copyrighted materials? See, that's the challenge. Ah, let's talk. Um, but see, that's the type of stuff I think our discovery systems would be much better if we actually poured in there what we have on basis of well-known technology. Like, why don't we index full text into search engines? That's, see, and, and I think that would vastly improve, uh, improve our, our systems, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, as I said again, artificial, in, let's call it machine learning, is already, it, it's already been there for quite a while. And, you know, let's put the large language models out of the picture for a moment. And for example, again, look at how artificial intelligence or machine learning can, uh, for example, enhance full text, named entity recognition and linking, put that into an index. And I think we can really move the search experience forward without um, the hype around uh, uh, large language models. Um, one thing though, I think we really have to 
take into account is maybe the new um, approach of like what people are going to enter into our search boxes. Um, and uh, I talked to Duncan the other day. He has, uh, we've heard this a couple of anecdotal evidence, is that the word of the day, um, that the people are going to start to write in the give me literature about, I don't know, the first world war written by women from France, right? That's a, that's a natural language query. But I think we can look into how we can map this query into something our current systems are going to understand. Like we don't have to throw all the underpinnings away to, 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 get, to, to fulfill those new requirements that, that users might uh, want to have. Um, I think I'll just leave it at that, and we can discuss mm -hmm. about um, I found it an interesting point that you um, built a bridge from the AI topic back to our current uh, systems. Um, and I would like to um, ask you, Damien, you, uh, you expressed um, the acceptance of possible changes in the future, dramatic changes. Um, I, I'm not sure how how this uh, arose, but um, because we see that you find, I was really uh, um, um, excited to hear how many new uh, institutions in Germany um, will use or just switch to, to ViewFind. So um, could you imagine ways, maybe like uh, Felix uh, just um, outlined, uh, how AI systems or AI similar systems or um, yeah, in this technology could maybe um, find their way into the existing viewfind so to um, create a new generation of viewfind systems which already include such technologies or approach to this type of uh, technology. Well, I think there are a lot of possibilities because the very design of ViewFind is meant to allow a broad range of possibilities. It's a framework for providing search options to your users, but it's really not particularly opinionated about where those search results come from. And it gives you a lot of mechanisms for combining things together, displaying things in different configurations and providing supplemental information. So, you know, there's really no reason you couldn't write an entirely AI powered backend that takes a query in and spits out a list of documents and ViewFind would work pretty much the same except for that backend piece. Or, of course, you could have preprocessors, as was alluded to, that takes natural language, converts it into a solar query. Or you could have recommendation modules, which provide headers or sidebars with suggestions that could lead to additional links. The, you know, the possibilities are, I think, quite broad. Um, and it's really just a matter of deciding which ones are practical. You mean something like using an AI to understand natural a language and turn it into a machine language so for, for instance exactly so you could like you could say to an art an ai agent you know these are my solar fields and my definitions mm. you know how to construct a solar query because i'm sure they do so take the user's input and turn it into the most relevant solar query and send it here and then the, everything else is the same sounds so exciting i will try it <laughs> Um, I'd like to encourage the both of you to also jump into the discussion um, uh, so it doesn't have to go to back to me each time. And um, I would also like to, if you in the audience have a very urgent idea or statement to make, then please raise your hand and you will have the chance to do that. Uh, one thing that, you know, this discussion, we are always now talking about users coming to us looking for something and us providing it. And I think that's a pretty valid use case. But I think there's also other, again, maybe more um, low hanging fruits. Um, for example, when it comes to, to personalization, because I think you mentioned um, usage data or something like that earlier as a means to, to sort of boost certain things. And um, one thing that I found quite interesting is that at some point Google asked me, 
uh, about my preferences to give me better advertisement. I mean, they have all the data about me, but they still just directly ask me, why don't we build a little onboarding something into a discovery system on the first login? It just asks you, hello, who are you? What are you interested in? And then you have context information for further things. And then maybe with that stuff, you can, you can do other things. One thing I've been thinking about a lot is, is sort of, and somebody mentioned like TikTok earlier, how can we maybe push information, like not expect people to come to us, but push information to the people, maybe on the basis of a context that we just ask them, what are you interested in? Um, maybe it would be really interesting. Yesterday there was this slide with Ask a Librarian. I really like that. Maybe sort of this, you know, follow a librarian or, or, or something like mm. make discovery not only about actively searching, but about bringing stuff to users based on what you know. Mm. This actually takes me to the topic of, of project management, maybe, and environment management. If you have such ideas, who are you going to, uh, who, who is the person to, uh, to tell about such ideas and to bring it into the project management? I'm sorry, I was interrupting, I think. I don't really feel prepared to, to I mean, yeah, uh, 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 <laughs> well, at, at this point, uh, yeah. clients come to me and ask me, but uh, yeah, uh, did you want to add to this? Yes. Hey, hi, uh, Alex Krug, Bonn. Um, so, I mean, for this community, we all are connected to WooFind and some and connected to getting a stand behind the pillar. <laughs> behind, uh, we somehow have to get data into our indexes for WooFind to display them to the user, right? So these are two common shared touch points for this community. Not all of us, some of us are using a predefined index somewhere, but let's, for, they, for, the, for, for many of us, both of, are the same. So, what, I, what, I, what seems to be happening is like, and Trophic put out this blog post very recently about like how to put chunks into your embedding database and how to use language models to make better chunks. So there's like, we're in, the, in that hype cycle, they're kind of starting, they're, they're starting to climb into productive products now, at least I feel, in this particular space. So this is like what you just said in terms of like uh, how to use new technology to improve our data. I think the record manager that our Finnish friends have built is a central piece of the puzzle. Because, I mean, you guys built ANIF, right? So you have some machine learning experience. You build the record manager, and putting ideas from one into the other might be something that we all could benefit from and we all could contribute to in some way. And I think in WooFind, there's also like a few points where you could think about like adding functionality that requires more compute. And it's also a focal point where we all could come together and build something together because like the project management, right? We have very limited resources and we have a few points where we all kind of are connected to and we have to do stuff there and not each in our own little project somewhere else. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the areas where that is really obvious is in sort of the knowledge graph area as opposed to the AI area, because I know several people in this room have various implementations of getting more information about entities from within records and search results, but it's all local at the moment. Uh, at Villanova, the staff there is asking me, hey, can we start incorporating this kind of thing into viewfind i don't want to write that i want to steal yours so we should uh we, we should really uh and we've talked about this on several occasions but i think we need to actually take action figure out what are the common denominators that we can share so that we have at least a solid foundation that everyone's local solutions can be specializations of rather than all being completely discrete from one another Maybe just one addition. I think before we go out there and build all this stuff, we really, we heard about a sort of user research today. We should really verify that all of this stuff is relevant and then decide on, on what to do.
right? It's really expensive to build something and then find out it doesn't work. So I think that's something we should, we should really learn, prototyping, validating all of these ideas before making quite costly uh, investments. So that's sort of where I would bring these ideas, not to my engineers, build this, but you know, with, with my colleagues who are talking about user research, well, this could be an idea, let's try to validate it. I would like to stress again that this is always a question of strategy, right? I mean, we heard this inspiring talk by um, Tilman Shea uh, about the integration uh, of his solution into this public library catalog, which, which I, I presume will do something for people. But as Felix put it, uh, people in, in special libraries or university libraries will, will resent this. I, I, I can't see a use case. Of course, we, have, we will have to check on it, but we also have to reflect our long-standing history of uh, reference services. I'm, I, I'm a reference service by, by reference librarian by training, uh, and I teach uh, reference at, uh, at, at a program in, in Berlin. And what, what I teach people is how reference used to be and that people came to the library and it, the library was the only place where you could get information on like the address of your, uh, uh, of your member of parliament or something. These days are long gone and do we, do we want them back? I, I, I don't really think so, do we? Um, so, but but uh, we, we have to have a, a strategy and the strategies will be different for different types of libraries. I think there was a question in the back. Mm, yes, uh, one from the chat, um, or more a remark. Our institution from Maccabee Lewine, our institution is exploring using a sense. You answered that question. And um, a response about uh, we are playing. So, uh, to, to answer the, the question of using AI to power uh, similar items, just over the past couple of weeks, I've spoken to at least two people who are looking at that from different directions. Uh, I think Maccabee at Lehigh has talked about doing some local experiments with training a model to make uh, similar suggestions. Uh, and uh, Damien, there's another Damien, uh, at Michigan State University uh, is using an AI model to generate call numbers for records in their catalog that lack call numbers so that the existing similarity can work better by having more uh, data to work from. So it's definitely being thought about. Oh, well, um, Anna, I would like to come back to one of your uh, points in your uh, statement uh, about uh, IT, about security. Uh, could you elaborate a little more what you actually meant uh, with security? Do, do you meant in uh, terms of IT security or was it uh, in another? Well, I, I meant, I was referring to the fact that we as an institution we, who ho that, that hosts different WooFind installations or uses indexes uh, uh, located elsewhere. We, we see a lot of um, bots coming to mm. the indexes. This is something that everybody experiences, and this is, this is an ongoing task we, we have uh, in, in refining nearly every day or every week uh, mm. what, what we do and how, how we pre prevent these, these bots. And we have, we have clients who, are, who have been under cyber attacks and um, um, we, we see that happening every day. So we, we, we spent a lot of time negotiating legal um, documents with clients about what we can do and not do and uh, th this is this is a whole new 
thing. It, it's not new, but it's it, it's a big thing. It's a big chunk of work, and this is why uh, I, I I I said I'm 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 so angry. We we have to spend so much time on this uh, housekeeping stuff, on 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 the security issues, on on making everything watertight, uh, uh, security wise and legal legally and. Um, we have the, 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 the upkeep and all this eats up just so much. I and um, I, much, much, much as I see the, how people would love to experiment with um, AI-based recommendations, I see a certain tiredness, especially within the group of long-term discovery using institutions that they are just you know tired of spending money on just the upkeep and and it it, it takes away a lot of energy mm -hmm. and we, we we are always in between the two paradigms do it locally and for yourself and and be enthusiastic about it and then you a few years after the implementation, you realize, oh my God, you have to spend a lot of time and energy on it. Better collaborate with with someone, and that. But then all your special beloved features will go away, um, and um, um, it's it, it's it is difficult. And also within within um, settings in in communities, it is difficult to negotiate how to implement. Um, innovation and how to create a project that that that, that create that makes something that gives meaningful results for every member in the corporation. Innovation is oftentimes something that's driven by someone locally. Like you invented WooFind back in the day. It was it was you, and it it grew. But it was not like some committee said. We need a worldwide uh, discovery system that that is written in a in a popular uh, programming language. Nothing of the sort happened. You 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 made it. You built it. It grew, and um, it's it's it is a difficult point. I think where we at. So I, this doesn't exactly directly lead from that, but the, the thought that's been forming in my head is that I, I also think that there's, there's this tendency to want to take the latest tool and have it completely solve our problem end to end in one step. And, and I think what, what I'm encouraged by is seeing people taking the step back and, and seeing the smaller gaps that can be bridged and the perhaps more realistic uh, applications, um, which is not to say that we can't eventually have uh, a purely AI-driven discovery system that does everything, but I'm skeptical about how quickly that can happen. And I'm also concerned about the possibility of, say, having a viewfind instance that could be prompted to make threats against world leaders or any of the other bizarre things we've seen happening. So. Um, It, it, and I think this is just a technological trend. Like we, we need to not allow the tools to completely replace our human ingenuity and thoughtfulness. We don't want our users to stop thinking either. We just want to make them think about the right things as should we, uh, but that's always the challenge. And that's, that's sort of the reference librarian thought process as well. Um. <clears throat> Maybe this is just a little bridge to something that, that I had on, on my mind because you just said something about, you know, uh, the ingenuity and, and like I was always wondering what comes after discovery. What do people do with materials they discovered? And I don't have an answer to this. But one thing, we had this product uh, vision workshop a couple of uh, months ago and something that came up again and again was sort of interactivity so basically can we also provide or should we provide means to work with the materials that have been found and i don't you were talking about uh sort of uh an ecosystem of different systems so i'm not necessarily saying this has to be a monolith and you know um has to be implemented natively in a discovery system but how does it fit in with with, with other things for example you were talking about local content earlier right and as as um 
Berlin State Library, we have quite a lot of historic content that's quite unique to us. And like focus on this, digitize it properly, give good means, you know, we talked about this yesterday, triple IF access to all of these things, maybe sort of, you know, bridge the gap between traditionally, you know, there's the OPAC, then there's the discovery system, and then there's these weird digitized collections. And maybe they should be moving closer together or interact more, right? Um, and what I really like the idea out of this session, somebody said, sort of run code on our platforms with materials that we can't give out. Like that, that was something I'm going to take that home and think about it because this is this is this is really interesting and could solve real problems. Like I can't give you this bulk data legally, but I can provide you with means to do scientific work. That's that really resonated with me. And so, yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts about sort of, you know, beyond search interactivity, working with the materials. Where does, does that come into play? Should it? I think it definitely should. And I, I like, like I said earlier, um, I think of discovery as one part in, in an ecosystem. And maybe it could also have different layers. You, you introduced the idea of asking people about their interests and, and this could be a layer, but there could also be a layer where you can play, do something playful with the data so, as, as appropriate in, in, in the respective context, context. And there are so many interesting ideas out there we, we haven't what, what we what nobody has talked about here so far is oh i can't pronounce this word visualizations um but th this used to be a, a big thing i think a couple of years ago libraries dresden springs to mind yeah. they visualize they, they created this graphs of results lists but um um this 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 would be another thing that that uh, I, ca I I could um, imagine in, imagine happening on an abstract layer on top of the discovery system that would pull data from other sources as well and and um, give people the chance to play around with it in in some I, I, I imagine like graphs of who who has written a letter to whom in what context and and things like this in, in, in the digital humanities context. Yeah, exactly. I also thought about it when you when you spoke about those bots and things, and maybe a, a lot of them will have uh, questionable intentions, but uh, a lot, some of them also, uh, I think, are uh, projects of people who want to work with data, data from libraries, with metadata, maybe even with full text data, like um, data mining, like, um, uh, like you um, touched right now. And um, should we as libraries maybe provide more actively APIs to our data to enable uh, people working with AI systems uh, um, uh, to have our data and roughly all, yeah. I was, I was going to say yes, provide more APIs until you said for the AI systems. Because yeah. we really, there's one thing we really have to think about, and I think the colleagues from the Dutch National Library have already made up their mind there. A lot of the stuff we are putting out there is basically CC0 license, and they can just like, but so I would say yes, you know, it really depends for to whom, and I would say yes, we need to maybe put out more uh, APIs for the use cases we just touched, but not necessarily for big corporations to come grab the data and put them into some weird closed source model, but for maybe our, you know, end customers. I actually didn't say uh, big companies, just people working with AI systems. <laughs> it could be small projects as well. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. No, no. But, if it's, yeah. but this is a really, a really interesting point um, to say there, is, there are companies, commercial companies, we do not want, want to work with our open data. Is that true? I would actually say, I, I would say we need a strategy. We need an opinion about this. As an institution, you should make up your mind. I'm not saying yes or no, but you need to think about this. 
right? Because, I mean, these things are just gobbling up oh. a lot of, of work. And then we've heard it earlier, you buy it back for tokens and suddenly these tokens are really expensive. And oh. I mean, it consumed your data. What the hell? Hmm. Right. So, so I just think you have to make up your mind. You should just, shouldn't just let it happen. And if you're fine with it, fine. Then you have a policy that just accepts it. And as I said, the Dutch colleagues, they have made up their mind and they said no. I, I remember a discussion here in, a, in the city of Leipzig, um, uh, one of their open data uh, events they made for the, for the local communities. And they said, uh, I hope I quote them right. <laughs> um, well, if we put the data of our uh, local uh, tra tra traffic, uh, Local transport. local transport online and make it freely available, Google could come and use it for their Google Maps service. And I thought, what's the problem? And I, the, 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 this, the, the moment in our discussions reminds me of, of this event. I mean, what, what could happen? Not, not specifically about APIs, but I, I think getting into the ethics of of the situation the other thing that i personally find fairly concerning are the reports about the resources being spent on running all of these systems and what are the consequences of becoming too reliant and scaling up too much are we using you know a giant high energy uh, mm. solution to a potentially lighter weight problem. Uh, and that, that again comes into the using it intelligently rather than just making it the blanket solution to all problems. Uh, and you know, this comes from somebody, I, I use a manual lawnmower and scissors in my yard. So maybe <laughs> I'm <a> oversensitive. <laughs> there was a question, sorry. <laughs> Yes, um, thank you. <clears throat> on the topic of ethics, I, I dislike that we're focusing so much on one company and its gigantic electricity bill. I mean, there is another question of ethics when it comes to the discovery system in terms of the biases we reproduce, you know, through the knowledge infrastructures that we are using, building, and as librarians and libraries more or less personally responsible for. Let's not kid ourselves. We put this stuff out there. And I'm wondering in how far that is not another area of future development for the discoveries. How can we um, try to counteract this? And also we see this in our user base, at least in my case, the interest in provenance-based research and content warnings uh, is increasing and people are getting more sensitive about not just, they don't just wanna know what are these documents, but also what's kind of in them. Is it sensitive? Um, is it ethically? So is that something that you're, you have thoughts on? Uh, I don't want to cut off others, but I definitely have, have strong feelings about this. You know, I think we've already seen the well-documented filter bubble phenomenon with Google. And I think AI has the potential to make that even worse by saying, there is this one answer to your question and I am the authoritative source for that answer or implying that at least. And so I think, there is a real need to have chat be more like a reference librarian and interact with the user, clarify, offer alternatives, but that's not perhaps the commercially viable approach. And that's the challenge. I think we could potentially build the more responsible version of this, but how do we persuade people to actually use it? Uh, that, is, that is the biggest question. Uh, and I don't have the answer to that but I would like to. <laughs> because it's going to be not very sexy and it'll t take a long time. Like the, the negotiation will take a long time. If you, if you are at the rest, if you, if you worked at the rest reference desk in the eighties, somebody would come to you and, and ask about um, the, the, the health system in ancient Rome. And you would like, uh, search for a, a book on 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 the the, the the cultural history of 
Rome and then go to the stacks, find the book and, and uh, uh, work with the user to find the relevant chapter and say, okay, now you go ahead and make sense of it yourself. And you would probably say, well, this is, this may be an old book. Well, I, re I, I the, the, the scenario I, I am remembering is talking to a pupil who would, a, a school, a, a high school student who would, who would do this. And then you, you, the student would say, well, this book is very old. And you would say, well, your topic is very old. It doesn't matter if this, this book is from the 60s. Do go ahead and, and use the index. Look, there's, there's an index and, and you, you have all this, this information literacy Literacy, literacy chat around it, but this would be very hard to build compared to what, how an, a, a dialogue with um, chat GPT looks like nowadays. But this is not what you meant. But um, um, I think it would be interesting, and, and I'm, I'm always encouraging librarians to make their knowledge more visible. Like librarians have a lot of knowledge. If, if they look at, at, at a results list in a traditional OPAC, they, they weed it out real quick and say for a certain purpose, if they search for a book on the healthcare system in ancient Rome, they, they, they are really, really quick in finding the, the best possible book for the high school student in front of them. And there's a not, lot of knowledge in place. And this knowledge, I've, I, I have thought for a long time, could be made visible. And this has, but this has nothing to do with AI or something. This has something to do with like, us being aware of how we use information, what information do we have on information, and making this more accessible. Unfortunately, we are already approaching the end of our time box. So I would like to give each of you the opportunity to make a short closing statement. And then this is the end of our panelists. <laughs> I have to think. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm hung up on reference librarians now. I can't, I can't <laughs> help it. No, no. Uh, but, but I mean, I, I think this is an interesting problem because Reference librarians have always been one of our best search engines, but people don't like talking to other people or they're worried that they're going to bother the other people or whatever reasons come into play that prevent them from talking to these valuable resources. And I have a, sort of wondered now that we're moving into this chat mode, whether this can also be used as a way to trick our users into actually talking to real people again. Um, so, you know, think about that. What, and what, what if you have your, your chat agent and the person says, I want to talk to a real person? Maybe we should encourage that. <laughs> this is hard to directly answer, but, but I, 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 love the, I, I, I certainly love the idea. And um, one of my projects was um, in, at the beginning of the 21st century to create a chatbot based on rules and we, we, we wrote rules with regular expressions and this was very limited but it had its charms you know it, it was kind kind of kind of nice in a way I hope um, well I, I, I hope that there will be enough room for meaningful innovation but but but, but still maintain a good standard, and I think WooFind is so loved by by many people around the world. But maybe maybe loved is respected. I should use the word respected respectfully because because it it does a good job. It it does a really good job. And building a modern version of an OPAC is something to achieve, right? It's 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 it's, it's a good thing to do. And um, yeah, there are a lot of right points to focus on, I, I think. But I also like that you referred to the whole project as ephemeral. It's just a blip in the radar of the history of catalogs, particularly. Think, think of the history of catalogs. It is, it's centuries long. And we, what, what we are discussing here is just a really short um, time in the whole span of, of information management. Um. Maybe I'll put it this way. When we, <clears throat> when we made the decision for Viewfind, I think it was maximum of 50% a technological choice. We, we vetted for Viewfind because of the community, because we knew that, you know, technology changes, but if we have a 
community that shares the same challenges that will probably prevail, right? Um, and so you mentioned earlier that you have your, if you have your local installation and you can have all your little special things. And I think um, what would be really interested to, to maybe really uh, co cooperate more in terms of user-driven development and maybe focus on building stuff people really want as a community. Try to figure this out together and then we'll see how we really implement it. But that like get more user-centric, that would be something that I would wish for. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, and that's what I mean. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very nice statements. And uh, do, we touched very interesting points, I think. Unfortunately, the time is already up. But maybe we can discuss these things in the future here or in other events to come. Thanks a lot.